seeking to deliver for was his own. They're the ones that received a half a million dollars from this group, and then he turned around and personally intervened to give a half billion dollars to the group that had paid his family off. And as for getting the work of Canadians done, he's the one that shut this place down for six weeks to make sure nobody could get at the truth. Simple question. This is a yes or no. There are hundreds of pages blacked out. Will he remove that ink and let Canadians read every single word, yes or no? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the enthusiasm the Conservatives have for this one issue, uh, they can certainly continue to talk about the We Charity and spin conspiracy theories. We're going to stay focused on delivering for Canadians. And Mr. Speaker, the member from Carleton actually talked about the fact that he doesn't believe in big government programs. We know that from the Conservatives. However, the 8.8 .8 million Canadians that received the CERB, the 3.5 million jobs that have been saved by the wage subsidy, these are the things we've been focused on, and I was very pleased to see the Conservatives unanimously endorse our plan to move forward last night and continue to support Canadians through this pandemic. What we have done is rely on the expertise of the researchers, the scientists, and the experts to guide us in the measures that we're taking to respond to COVID-19. We'll continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, because we know that, in fact, science and research is the key that to, to unlock the next set, set of tools that Canadians and, in fact, all global citizens are waiting for. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary Knows Hill. Well, I believe the information the Minister has relied upon to date is that COVID-19 is not transmitted to person to person. Masks don't work. Border <laughs> controls are quasi-racist. That's the information she's relying yes. upon. So yes. forgive us if we don't believe her. Why is she apologizing for Chinese numbers on COVID-19 transition? Why is she trusting Chinese numbers more than reviews from tests that Japan has approved? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister. seem to have had a technical difficulty. I want to make sure everybody's got their mute on and we'll ask the Minister of Health to uh, start her answer. The Honourable Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the member opposite may realize, science evolves. And in fact, when coronavirus, when COVID-19 first arrived on the global stage, not a lot was known about the virus. And every step of the way, we've worked with researchers, scientists, and the excellent public health officers across the country to ensure that our response meets the million new dollars for early learning and childcare to help a sector that has been hard hit by COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we know the figures that are required and what the government is proposing right now is wholly inadequate. It is simply not enough to provide the child care and the educational funding supports the provinces need. So when will this Liberal government commit to the adequate funding, the sufficient funding, to make sure parents will know that their kids are safe in school? Honourable Minister. I find it really hard for the leader of the NDP to claim that $625 million plus $400 million just in the next eight months is inadequate. That is completely opposite to what we're doing. sanctions on Belarus, sanctions which the previous Conservative government put in place in 2006, sanctions which we've been seeking for some time, sanctions which the government lifted in 2017. Now China is violating human rights and international treaties like the Geneva Convention in its treatment of Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, the Uyghurs and the people of Hong Kong. Will the government now impose sanctions on those responsible in China and in Hong Kong? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, first in regards to Belarus, we will not be silent as the government of Belarus continues to commit systematic human rights violations. That's why in coordination with the UK and in support of the people of Belarus, we're imposing sanctions against the government of Belarus officials, including Alexander Lush uh, Lukashenko. Uh, in regards to China, we continue to stand up uh, for the interests and rights of Canadians. We continue to demand the safe return of the two Canadians arbitrarily detained by China uh, for political purposes. We continue to raise the plight of the Uyghurs. We continue to express concern over Hong Kong and the 300,000 Canadians there. We will continue to, to work with the international community on standing up strongly. Goes at us. Member for Carlton. I rise today to report a million missing paychecks. That's the number of people who've lost their jobs since February and have not been hired back. We have the highest unemployment of the G7. The US, UK, France, Italy, Japan, Germany, they all had COVID too, but they have lower unemployment than we do. Mr. Speaker, when will this government recognize that their plan to impose austerity on private sector mines and small businesses is not working? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the economic support we have been providing to Canadians during the pandemic has not only prevented a great deal of human misery, it is also driving our economic recovery. And you don't need to take my word for it. I quote, Federal government income support programs have so far been paramount for averting the delinquency tsunami and protecting the economy. TD economist Ksenia Bushman. Well, member for Carlton. Oh, yes, the bankers are very happy. Yeah. They're making all kinds of money these days, Mr. Speaker. But you know who's not happy? The million working class people who no longer have jobs. Yes. Who had to go come home and sit at the kitchen table with their spouse and say, Honey, I no longer have work or a paycheck, and I don't know what we're going to do. No government program can replace the mighty force of our 20 million workers, the power of a paycheck. Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister contradicted his own government on the shutdown of the pandemic warning system. In an interview last weekend, the Health Minister admitted the pandemic warning system had been shut down and the decision was being examined. Yesterday, the Prime Minister suggested his government made no change to the system. Both these things cannot be true, Mr. Speaker. Why is the government spreading misinformation about their shutting down of Canada's pandemic early warning system? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me be really clear about one thing. Canada today is facing a grave second wave of the coronavirus. Now is the time for all of us to come together and fight this second wave, which is ravaging Europe and our neighbour to the south. Now is the time for us to focus on what we can do going forward to save Canadian lives and to preserve the Canadian economy. There will be a time for post-mortems, Mr. Speaker, but while the plane is flying, you don't try to change the engine. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, if you made some errors while the plane was taking off, you should learn them before the plane has to land, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. There has been another disagreement between the shutting down of the pandemic warning system. In the same interview, the Health Minister said the review into closing the system hadn't started yet. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said the review was complete. So will the Deputy Prime Minister let this House know? Is it over? Has it started yet? And who will they appoint to review the decision to shut down Canada's pandemic warning system? Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, what I'm focused on, what the government is focused on, and what I believe all members of this House need to be focused on today is the crisis before us. We need to work together. South. We have to take in these numbers. 10,000 Canadians have died because of COVID-19. 80% of them have been in long-term care homes. 
But what's even more staggering is how clear the evidence is that the worst conditions were found in for-profit long-term care homes. Now, the evidence makes it clear. So my question to the Prime Minister is this. Knowing that the worst conditions were in for-profit homes, does he still believe the federal government should be in the business of for-profit long-term care homes? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is right that there have been particular concerns about how our elders have fared in for-profit long-term care facilities. We cannot turn a blind eye to this, and I very much agree that all options need to be on the table when we think about how we run, operate, and regulate our long-term care facilities in the future. The life of our elders must be a priority. Our country as a whole has not done well enough, and we need to do better going forward. Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, this government isn't transparent or consistent about applying their pandemic rules. Another day and yet another revelation that a wealthy U.S. executive was granted a quarantine exemption when he entered Canada on October 19th to push the Teamster Union workers to accept a new contract. Wow. The first time this kind of thing happened, the minister said it was a mistake, but he hasn't fixed it. Quarantine restrictions are enforced on everyday working Canadians, their small businesses, their family members. So a very simple question. Why why is there still one set of rules for wealthy, well-connected elites and a different set for everyone else? The Honourable Minister.